Place your advance order now on Amazon for the very first volume of the New Thinking Aloud Dialogue series, Is There Life After Death? Publication date is June 1st. Thinking Aloud Conversations on the Leading Edge of Knowledge and Discovery with Psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is gender transformation, and my guest. Samantha Danielle Caputi is a friend and colleague of several years. I know her as Danny, and Danny has been a guest on New Thinking Aloud three times previously, talking about such diverse topics as psychic weather control, the mind body problem and a sense of identity and the use of random event generators and parapsychological testing. Danny has a doctoral degree in atmospheric science. She's based in the San Francisco Bay Area in Northern California. And now I'll switch over to the internet video. Welcome, Danny. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Yeah, thanks for having me back. We're going to talk about a very different topic than, than we have in the past, and I'm sure it's going to get very personal. So, I want to let you know I'm very grateful that you're, you're willing to open up uh, about, well, we don't know. I mean, I don't know what's going to come up, but I thought a good starting point would be your childhood. I was born in 1992. Um, to two wonderful parents in um, uh, New York, Long Island. And um, I grew up there. And around five or six years old, I would say, I uh, was exhibiting certain developmental issues. And um, eventually I got diagnosed on the autism spectrum. And so um, that was you know, I was already not on a track to fit in growing up. And, um, you know, as I progressed into, you know, my late elementary, early junior high, um, I began to develop a gender dysphoria. So I was born male and I felt very, very dysphoric about that in terms of not feeling like my body is developing in, in the way that I wanted it to. And I wanted to ultimately do something about that, whatever that treatment would look like. And, um, it's a lot more I could talk about about my childhood, but that's, uh, since we're here to talk about, you know, trans issues, I figure that's, that's a good place to start. So how old would you say you were when the gender dysphoria became evident? Yeah. So I would say that I experienced it a bit between, um, you know, starting around age five. So very young. And that's very typical what you see in the media. You know, um, Jazz Jennings is a famous case of, you know, um, <laughs> who has a whole reality TV show, but where gender dysphoria develops, you know, from a very, very young age. Um, I, had a little bit at, at a young age, but for me, it was more during puberty when it uh, when it accelerated, when it became worse. Well, gender dysphoria sounds like a clinical term, uh, and I'm sure there's a lot of literature about it. But can you be more specific about how that felt to you? What it, what your inner experience was like? Totally. Yeah. So gender dysphoria, I, you know, I talk about that in the clinical sense because I actually don't really like the identity based model of um, transgenderism, as I'll say, you know, um, so a lot of times nowadays, you know, we hear people talking about 
being transgender as an identity, something you identify as or identify with. And that is, of course, part of the equation. Uh, but I think the focus on that has kind of led a lot of us down the wrong path in terms of understanding what it actually is. So, for example, you know, um, it leads to these metaphysical speculative questions about what it, you know, quote unquote, really means to be a man or really means to be a woman, you know, and then we get into the differentiation of sex versus gender. And, you know, there's this whole debate about, um, you know, some people say that if you differentiate those and say gender is, you know, what you socially present as, whereas sex is biology, then you're by definition enforcing stereotypes. And then there becomes other questions about, um, you know, like what is a woman, which is a, you know, um, a documentary that was released last year. And um, I think there is legitimate criticism in, in terms of, um, you know, the, 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 some of the people from that interview, not really able to provide a definition, but really to me, the, the characteristic of being transgender is gender dysphoria, which is a medical condition um, that, you know, I just so happen to experience. And the treatment for that is to, you know, or one of the treatments for this, this isn't the right treatment for everybody, but the right treatment for me was to undergo medical procedures um, and to take cross-sex hormones to look and resemble the opposite sex to the extent medically possible. You know, so I don't go around saying I am the same as a, as a biological woman. Um, I instead just live my life as if I were one to the, to the extent possible. And that is, you know, was in my case, the best treatment for the gender dysphoria that I had, the, the, the deep, unsettling feeling I had about my body. And in a lot of cases, you know, should always, people should be evaluated prior to starting this treatment because it is intense and a lot of it is irreversible. And um, if, uh, you know, so to be properly evaluated that this isn't just escaping from another kind of condition, you know, um, and then somebody would later regret transitioning, you know, so those things have to be teased apart in the beginning to the extent possible. So um, that's why it's important. That's why I use the terminology gender dysphoria to describe the experience, even though that's a clinical sounding term. I think that's really how we have to be thinking of this issue rather than the identity based model that, you know, the um, current ideologies push. Well, what I'd like to do is go back and if you can remember what it was like for you as, let's say, a 12 or 13 year old boy. How, how did that feel? What, what were some of your experiences at that time that led you to become the person you are now? Around 12 or 13, um, 13, 14, when I, you know, um, puberty was accelerating, I remember one of the first things I noticed was, um, really being uncomfortable with um, the hair I was developing and the the lowering of my voice. And I would even ask teachers, I was like, oh, is it normal to like, I don't really like the, the hair on my legs. I don't really like the fact that I'm growing body hair. And um, pretty much the response I got was, oh no, you should love it. That's, uh, you know, um, yeah. Uh, and, and so it was kind of this discontinuity between what I was experiencing and what I, you know, was told I should be experiencing in terms of my feelings about puberty. Um, and so I, you know, did kind of some research online. I actually, I had a wonderful, uh, teacher who actually, um, at the time because of my autism spectrum disorder, and I was having difficulty like focusing in class. Um, so she would kind of be there to like, you know, help me stay focused. Um, she did really wonderful research actually on my behalf and then came back to me and said, actually, some of these things I was telling you was, was not correct. Um, you know, 
uh, this is a condition called, you know, gender dysphoria wasn't really a common word. Transgender wasn't. Um, but I was kind of pointed to these online communities of people who experience that condition. Um, and I didn't spend a whole lot of time on it, but I knew that was what I was experiencing and that I really was not supposed to grow up to be in a, you know, masculine looking body, right? I didn't want to grow, the thought of growing up into an adult, like male with like, you know, a beard and, uh, <laughs> you know, um, all the stereotypes associated with that just really just disgusted me to my core. And so, um, yeah, so I went to my parents. Um, they found a good therapist who uh, didn't right away aff affirm me, right? Because I think that that's important too. There's this notion that, you know, anybody experiencing this should be blindly affirmed. Um, and I don't think that's the case. I think people should be evaluated prior to starting treatment. Um, but, but I didn't go under any treatment as a, as a, you know, in my puberty years. Um, it was really just kind of dealing with um, those feelings of dysphoria for, you know, and I, I, I dealt with them kind of for another uh, four or five years before I started actually acting on it. And um, it wasn't until I moved to California in my early 20s when I uh, begun the journey of medical and social transition. I'm under the impression, and correct me if I'm wrong, that, uh, and I know there, this is a very hot button issue, I suppose, politically, that it's actually um, a good thing to start the transition earlier rather than later. Yeah, so there is some truth to that, but we have to look at it in context, right? So back in, you know, the... I'll say, you know, 80s and 90s, roughly, when, you know, treatment and awareness of gender dysphoria started to rise, you would sometimes get people presenting at a very early age with gender dysphoria, prominent gender, more than I had at an early age, and they would be, uh, they would be treated um, with puberty blockers and then later cross-sex hormones and surgery once they're an adult. Um, usually puberty blockers would start at around age 12. And for a while, it was working okay in the sense that there was not a whole lot of regrets. Um, but recently, um, there's this term in the literature called rapid onset gender dysphoria, which I actually, I don't think that's a very precise name for what it is, but it's this idea that there's this social contagion that with females in particular, right, girls going through puberty, it's very common, for instance, when they're developing breasts, for them to feel uncomfortable with it, for them to feel like, you know, something's not quite right. And in the past few years, um, really 10 years or so, I want to say, is when there's been more of a surge of that group go presenting at gender clinics. And I, I think, unfortunately, the, the, the kind of the blind affirmation of that has led to a lot of the the cases of regret we we see today. Um, however, so it is, so I would say the idea of transitioning kids and plus there's all sorts of side effects with puberty blockers, you know, um, this idea that they're completely reversible is just not entirely true, right? So we, we have to really look at that in the context of a risk benefit analysis for specific individuals. Um, and I think another thing that can't be ignored with that is, you know, it makes sense because of the influence of big pharma, you know, they're going to want to push <laughs> more drugs when they can. I mean, we saw that recently with recommendations that came out for uh, people as young as 12 uh, who have obesity to undergo weight loss surgery um, and not even necessarily try to change their, their diet or lifestyle style. And so it kind of baffles me almost how the, you know, I'll say 
you know, in general, the political left. Uh, it's not everybody on the left. Um, it's also some people, on, but in general, it's the political left has, you know, the supposed party of anti-corporatism has somehow become, you know, a bootlicker for big pharma almost in this sense. Um, I do also want to say that once somebody is an adult, it is probably, um, yeah, it's almost definitely better to transition as a young adult than as, than as an older adult. Um, it'll yield better results. Some of the preliminary data on, you know, long-term side effects from using hormones is suggesting that starting a new set of hormones in that period will minimize long-term health risks. Um, and it's just, it's just better to think of transition in terms of a life plan rather than, you know, um, unfortunately for a number of people, they, you know, live their life as men for several decades and then they hit this crisis, you know, and then they transition and then they're not always happy because they missed some of their younger years. Well, do you have any data regarding the percentage of people who go through the transition and then regret that they've done so? The classic numbers reported in the literature kind of range from like 0.1 to 1%, but a lot of that is lagged. A lot of that is before we had this tsunami of, you know, young girls who are just starting puberty presenting to these gender clinics. So we don't have, we're not going to have updated data on that for another few years. I mean, we can't because this is kind of a new phenomenon and where, you know, we have to follow up on those patients and then it takes longer to publish studies. In, in any case, your transition started, as, as you told me earlier, the, the physical transition, you were in your early 20s. And I, I, I gather that you feel that that's not a bad time. That might even be optimal. Wait until you're an adult before making you know, life-altering decisions. That's not to say that no person, again, it's, it, it has to be an individual risk-benefit analysis, you know, but it's not to say nobody younger would ever benefit from treatment, but I think the threshold has to be a lot higher. I recently interviewed a 72-year-old woman, and we're having this conversation about female elders in the psychedelic community. And uh, the topic came up that uh, some of them felt totally neglected, like being female could make you a second-class citizen. I always felt, for example, I had privileges that my sisters didn't have growing up. So I can understand why young girls would want to become male. I think, though, for a male to want to become a female does sort of mean a, a diminution of social status. That's a good point. But I do think that it depends on the case, right? So people that transition very young, somebody like Jazz Jennings, who has always lived as female um, or as if she was female, is not really going to experience male privilege at all. Um, but we can't also ignore the cumulative effects, right? So if somebody lived their life as a male for several decades and was able to um, go from, you know, um, you know, keep getting promoted at work, things of that sort, they've accumulated all this male privilege and some of that gets lost when they transition, but not all of it. So. I wouldn't say it's accurate to say that when we transition, we lose all of our male privilege, um, but it, it really depends on when we transition and the prior life experiences we had to that. And I just, I just want to actually talk about that for another moment is this, this idea of, you know, females feeling erased and, you know, second class citizens, because a lot of, a lot of women are starting to uh, get, you know, quite frankly, fed up with, uh, you know, as they'll call it, men pretending to be women or, you know, <laughs> trans women is the, is the proper term. And, you know, just, just to kind of speak to that group for a minute, it's like, I understand the concerns and I 
And, you know, whenever I see, for example, TikToks that go viral of, you know, trans people like mocking women or, um, you know, somebody going from straight male transitioning to become like lesbian uh, woman saying like, you know, you have to date us or uh, you're transphobic. That's another, that's another common trope. Um, there's, um, you know, this idea that you can just be trans by self IDing, like, you know, you don't have to experience dysphoria, you know, and concerns that women have with like over female spaces and restrooms. I understand those concerns given how, um, prominent these, um, you know, cases have been of people exhibiting this predatory like behavior. And um, I just want to say that, you know, in terms of the community, I think we need better accountability, especially particularly in the, the male to female trans community, particularly even even the subgroup of the older transitioning male to female um, category, specifically the ones that are attracted to women. Right. It's like we have to realize like there is that there is that power dynamic there that could put women in a position where they feel unsafe and we have to have better accountability so that we can actually come to, you know, discuss things like, okay, how do we deal with um, sports? How do we deal with self ID? At what, what, what point can somebody um, say they're a woman? And an example I use of this is that in the, in the black community, there's this talking point that gets said a lot um, about the black community, which is like, oh, what about black on black crime? Which is really just a distraction from the, you know, the notions of police brutality and like the systemic issues. But the black community has um, formed organizations, many organizations that address black on black crime in addition to fighting for systemic issues. The idea is you can do both. You can both acknowledge the systemic things that need to change and, you know, systemic oppression and also hold accountability for yourselves and do what you can to improve your own situation. You know, we just need more of that in the trans community. That's really, really lacking right now is this accountability aspect. It's all, you know, the victimhood. It's all the social justice side, which which is fine as, as its own thing, but it, it's on the spectrum, right? So we have to, we have to find the right balance. And as of right now, the activists are kind of enabling this bad behavior, enabling people that are flat out mocking women to speak for all of us. And yeah, and, and I think there just there just has to be better in community accountability so that we can have proper conversations and both address the systemic issues as well as having that accountability. I'm old enough so that I remember, I think it would have been back in the 90, early 60s, uh, Christine Jorgensen, I think, may have been the first male to go through the surgery and, and become female. And Christine Jorgensen became very famous, but it was such an unusual phenomenon. Like this was the first person in the world, as far as I knew, to, to transition. And the very idea that it was possible was, was a novelty. Now you have, I think in an earlier conversation, you and I were describing that maybe as much as 1% of the American population has gone through a transition. We're talking about millions of people. So, even so, it's still in the early stages. Uh, obviously, the culture as a whole is very unsettled around this. Yeah. And, you know, in, in the past couple of years, I mean, there's been this anti-trans push um, there's a website I found, translegislation.com, that tracks what they call anti-trans bills. Now, not necessarily every bill in there I'm, um, I'm against because, you know, I'd have to read all the individual bills. And like I said, 
there are some nuanced issues about self IDs, sports, when the right age for kids are. But there are other bills that are, you know, pushing restrictions for transition well into adulthood. And um, there's just online, like I'm just seeing in YouTube comments in the past couple months, you know, even on conservative channels where uh, this stuff is, you know, people in the past have talked respectfully about trans people. And now, you know, the, the dialogue has shifted, you know, people are clearly getting angrier. And I partially, I, I partially blame the media for that, for kind of featuring the most cringe, the most unhinged, um, you know, trans people, because obviously at, you know, they want to cause division um, among the population. I mean, the mainstream media that is, but I do think, you know, there's still, again, that accountability factor. And without that, you know, people might look at, you know, these crazy activists saying that, you know, date us or you're transphobic. Uh, there was a, there was a video like that a male to female trans person made about a week ago, threatening violence if she's not allowed to use the women's restroom. And so it, it's like, you know, it's understandable that people that are fence sitters are going to look at that and go statements like we should eradicate transgenderism from public life entirely. That almost seems reasonable in comparison. And they're almost compelled to that side. And, you know, me saying this is not saying we should lick the boots of transphobes or like the, you know, the far right that doesn't want us to exist. No, it's not saying, you know, a lot of people say that like, oh, so you're, you guys are saying if you just make a better argument, if you're just a little bit nicer to the Nazis, then, you know, they will, uh, you know, then they'll respect you. And it's like, no, that's not, <laughs> that's not what it is. The reason I'm into this respectability politics, as they call it, is because of those fence sitters that are not engaged in the fight, we have to if we want to get them over to our side, we have to have that balance of accountability. I know a lot of people, uh, particularly on the uh, right wing side of the political spectrum, talk about freedom. They want to be f free in all regards to say whatever they want to. You might even say that in, in, in extreme cases, they want to be free to kill people if they uh, feel threatened uh, by them. And there's a lot of legislation, the sta stand your ground laws and so on, that give people license to do exactly that. And it dawns on me that why shouldn't uh, uh, any person be free to define themselves any way they want in, in terms of uh, gender? Or sexuality, assuming that the, that it is uh, har is not harming other pe other people. Exactly. Well, well, you know they are. You know, people are free to do that, and I I agree. People should absolutely be free to you know call themselves whatever they want. You know, um, but when we're talking about certain things, like okay, um, you know, should somebody who looks like you, Jeff, be able to just say, I feel like a woman today and then use the women's restroom. You know, I, I, I think we could, we could both agree there should be some boundaries on exactly, you know, where that line is when it becomes recognized in, in society, into law, right? You know, sports is another classic example of like, you know, if somebody can just self ID into, um, into it. And, you know, the other thing I want to say is people might take this as like uh, anti non binary, anti, you know, 86 genders or whatever. I'm not against that stuff. It's just don't speak for me as a, you know, transsexual person who experienced dysphoria and medically transitioned. You know, if you're saying like, oh, you don't need dysphoria to be trans, right? That's a, that's a common saying now. And it's like, okay, well, sure, call yourself transgender if you want. Just don't speak for, don't speak for people who've had dysphoria, you know. And I actually think that might be where, you know, we kind of reclaim you know, trans people with dysphoria might want to reclaim this word transsexual. 
um, because so many people are identifying as transgender now who don't necessarily have dysphoria. They're welcome to do what they want with their physical presentation and identify how they like. It's just when it comes to like speaking over people in the community who've who've had these, you know, dealt with dysphoria for years, that's when it becomes an issue. It's like be as free as you want as long as you're not stepping on other people, right? You mentioned earlier that you were diagnosed at, at a much younger age of, of being on what you call the autism spectrum. It was that in any way related, do you think, to the gender dysphoria? You know, there is some literature out there about, about autism spectrum disorder and later onset gender dysphoria. So they could be related. Um, I've heard a hypothesis about mirror neurons being uh, being put out there before. And this, this actually gets really interesting because now we're getting into the, the science of like what makes somebody trans, what actually causes gender dysphoria. And there is a huge controversy in academia that started, um, well, let's give the background first. In the late 80s, um, early 90s, there's a sexologist by the name of Ray Blanchard. And what he proposed was that, um, and it was based on some earlier work, it wasn't entirely a, a new idea in the sense, but it was this idea that you can group people who are transgender into two categories depending on their sexual orientation. So in one group, uh, let's just say, just to keep this simple, we're talking about males who transition to women, but keep in mind there's a mirror image for women who transition to women. But so for males who transition uh, to women, um, there's one type which is uh, homosexual with respect to their birth sex. He calls these homosexual transsexuals. and this is basically people who tend to transition very young um, or they experience gender dysphoria very young and they are very naturally feminine. They, um, you know, if they're going to school as a boy, a lot of people are calling them, you know, sissies or slurs like that because, you know, they're, they're just naturally very feminine. Right. And they, they have, um, you know, well, I don't know, you, the, the brain studies get get weird, but they might that might be kind of the classic presentation you hear about, you know, a female soul in a in a male body. And and they will transition typically at the very latest in young adulthood. Then there's this other type, which is consists of um males who uh are either bisexual or straight with regard to their, their birth sex. So people who are basically males who are attracted to women and they'll experience gender dysphoria later in life. Usually it'll develop as a, as a teen. It might start very early, but it'll, it'll develop through puberty and they often transition later in life and they often hold very masculine jobs for, for many, many years. And now this idea that there's these two types wasn't really new, but it was the labeling, right? He called the, you know, uh, this, um, the homosexual type, he called them homosexual transsexuals for the, uh, for the heterosexual type. He called that uh, heterosexual or bisexual type. He called that the autogynephilic transsexuals. There's now this term autogynephilia, which is, you know, which literally translates to love of oneself as a woman, which uh, he proposed is this motivation for this group of heterosexuals transitioning um, in the sense that they just have this fetish. They just, you know, basically have a fetish for seeing themselves as women and then transition. And then this um, the homosexual type it, it, it's almost less stigmatizing because they're at least acknowledged as having, you know, female souls in that sense. But the label homosexual, transsexual is almost no less stigmatizing. Trans people, the trans community did not like this categorization at all. 
And it actually, it was kind of flew under the radar for a while until 2003 when another sex researcher named Michael Bailey uh, published a book called The Man Who Would Be Queen. And this is what stirred up a firestorm of controversy. Like there were a bunch of trans activists saying that basically this is slandering the entire community and all of that. Um, some of them went as far as actually doxing the researchers and trying to get them removed from their positions at universities. And then you have the sex researchers on another side saying like, this is just academic freedom. It's like, you know, we should be allowed to publish things even if you don't exactly like what it is. And so this, this stirred up this entire controversy. In order to kind of bridge this gap between the trans community and sex researchers, right? Because it's like those things can both be true. We want academic freedom, but we also want to, you know, not harm the trans community with with our studies, right? So, okay, so how can we bridge that gap? One of the ways is we should probably change the the, the terminology in the literature. You know, homosexual, like I said, homosexual, transsexual, or autogynophilic transsexual. Those terms are kind of stigmatizing. If they're stigmatizing, but they're accurate, that would be one thing. But I think there is also a, a lack of accuracy too, right? So for the autogynophilic subtype in particular, it, it might be true that some of them transition because of this fetish as, you know, Blanchard originally talked about. But for a lot of other of them, it'll, you know, kind of start in their teens as them maybe having this fetish or this unusual sexual orientation where they want to kind of become the thing that they desire, if that makes sense. They want to become what they're attracted to. That's, I think, actually a more accurate way of describing it is, is having this dimension of your sexual orientation where you're attracted to women but you also want to become what you're attracted to. You want to be with what you're attracted to as well as become what you're attracted to. Mm -hmm. It might be correlated with fetishes earlier on in transition, but ultimately most people in that, in that group transition due to gender dysphoria. And actually um, Deborah So, famous sex researcher now, um, she has a book called The End of Gender where she actually makes this distinction pretty well, I think. And I'm not in the camp of basically entirely defending Blanchard. I think that the way he went about making this two type was uh, somewhat reckless in the sense that for this entire group, what he called the autogynophilics, um, he didn't recognize that for a lot of them, gender dysphoria is why they transition ultimately. You know, even if they've had fetishes earlier in life, ultimately the, the the cause of their transition is the gender dysphoria, right? That's at least the proximal cause, right? Similar to the homosexual transsexual subgroup. And so I'm actually, I'm working on a paper right now that I hope will recontextualize this, uh, this two type framework in a way that, um, kind of makes everyone a little bit more happy that that will um, bridge this gap. It'll, it'll not ignore any data coming from the original studies, right? Because I do ultimately think that this two type categorization is correct, that you can cluster trans people in these, in these two groups. Um, but I contextualize it in a way that says that basically you get these two modes on this continuum where you're gonna get gender dysphoria, depending on someone's um, sexual orientation and um, what we call an erotic target inversion, right? So um, erotic target inversion is basically, like I described before, that's probably a better term for autogynophilia because um, feel you know that would imply fetish, but erotic target inversion Im implies it's more of a sexual orientation, which I think is, more accurate. It's that, you know, there's this dimension of orientation, just like, you know, intensity is one dimension where you could be uh, very hypersexual or very asexual. Um, 
direction is another dimension. Are you attracted to the same sex or the opposite sex or somewhere in between, right? That's a spectrum. And then also uh, the erotic target uh, inversion is a, is a dimension, right? And so the mistake that I think, um, you know, Blanchard made was assuming that the erotic target inversion only goes in one direction, right? I propose that it can be both positive and negative. So you have erotic target inversions and erotic target repulsions. I'm playing around with those terms a little bit, but if at that point, if you kind of map it out, it would make sense that you get two clusters of people experiencing gender dysphoria. And then all of the data is fine. It just recontextualizes the model. And I think it satisfies Occam's razor better because it's really, instead of these two entirely separate causes of gender dysphoria, you just have one under underlying cause, but it's just a result of being at two places on uh, with different combinations of these uh, sexual orientation dimensions. Lately, I hear uh, a term being used quite a bit in the media, LBGQT. Uh, which suggests they're lumping together a lot of different groups. And even within each of those initials, there are probably many subgroups uh, and who all get lumped together. They're, they're part of one category that needs some sort of, I suppose, special consideration in, in terms of uh, discrimination and equality laws. But I've also heard that there's there's a lot of conflicts between these various uh, subgroups. I have a friend who is a gay activist who expressed to me on, on one occasion that, that he and other gay AIDS activists, as it were, feel some resentment towards the trans people because they're getting all the attention these days, but they haven't spent all the decades working for uh, equality the way uh, other gay activists ha have done. Yeah, in community resentment is a is a huge issue and it's made worse by the fact that we're not allowed to have conversations sometimes. You know, you have it's like you're either on the you're either for trans or you're you know, or you're not in that in group. How do you have conversations with people in the community about how can we cuz if if any two people have resentment towards each other, the only way of resolving that is having conversations, talking it out, right? Saying, okay, how can we make this work? As long as that's not allowed to happen, as long as there's barriers to conversations, then, then I don't really see it getting a whole lot better. I think that's also going to continue to, even in the public eye, even outside of the LGBTQ community, you know, there's polls showing that acceptance for LGBTQ uh, people has been declining in recent years. And a lot of that's attributable to some far right wing wingers, you know, uh, becoming emboldened to be completely fair to the activists. That is part of it. But a lot of it is due to the fact that there's this cancel culture. If you even want to have a conversation about what to do about sports, if you even want to have a conversation about how do you handle kids with gender dysphoria, if, if you say to other trans women, like, hey, you know, um, it's good to accept reality, you know, some trans women say, like, trans women get periods, right? Even me disagreeing with that has gotten me defriended, removed from groups before. And, and it, it's almost absurd on the face of it. It's like, no, we do not get periods because we're biologically male, right? But in, in, in some trans groups, you can't even say that and have a conversation about it. and and so as long as there's these barriers it's i just don't see i just don't see it getting better well what you've brought up here is a, a category of people i have no experience with but obviously you're embedded in the trans community can you describe it and it's loose's term it's people that identify as transgender but the community is the community is kind of this in-group of, you know, people that tend to think alike in a lot of ways, and they they support the same activists. And, you know, 
it can be very toxic. Like if you're, if you're in that community and you disagree with something, you can, um, you can be canceled, right. And, and, and removed and ousted. And, um, it's really harmful actually for a lot of, you know, people just starting their transition who have been rejected by their families. This is the only group of friends that they have. And if they disagree with one thing, then, you know, cause again, they're, they're, you know, they're walking on eggshells. And so I do know a lot of trans people that have, you know, are kind of living their lives separate from the community. You know, like for me, like most of my friends are not within uh, that community. That doesn't mean I don't have trans friends, but you know, they're not really in that in group. And so like, if I say, you know, I think there's some truth to this autogynephilic, um, term, even though that's a stigmatizing term, uh, you know, I completely am canceled. Our program is called New Thinking Aloud. It's based on the original series, Thinking Aloud. And one of the reasons I wanted to invite you on to talk about this topic is to just help foster more conversations of, of, of this type. It seems to me that as a, as a member of a minority group myself, being Jewish, and uh, uh, with the intersection of being in parapsychology, I have a real appreciation for how mainstream culture has, has trouble with uh, all kinds of fringe groups and uh, all across the political and, and social spectrum. And I think overall, overall, uh, dialogue is, as you say, probably uh, one of the best solutions we have. There's one takeaway from this, right? It, it's to recognize that, you know, gender dysphoria itself is a medical condition um, specifically involving mental health. It, it's so important to not neglect the mental health treatment that comes with that. That doesn't mean don't transition medically. It just means address the mental health issues in concordance. You, you have to do additional work. You can't just transition. That's not going to cure the dysphoria. You have to do additional, you know, shadow work. Dialectical behavioral therapy is, is uh, one of the things coming at EMDR, you know, whatever it is um, to deal with those underlying feelings of dysphoria. And I think if we had more of that, if we had better uh, mental health coverage in this sense and encouragement of people, not just in the, and this goes for people outside the trans community feeling resentment or other feelings towards fringe groups, you know, maybe they have things to work on, you know, they should be getting therapy too, maybe. And just having better mental health treatment, I think would just really make the world a better place. A lot of that, that comes back to the systemic angle too, right? We don't really have, not everybody can afford that, which is, which is a legitimate systemic barrier. Um, but yeah, advocating for mental health, I think, will um, be one of the key solutions here. I've often felt, Danny, that the parapsychology community needs that, that academics who work in the field of parapsychology are subject to all sorts of persecution and, and career jeopardy and there's nobody sticking up for them at all. Yeah, unfortunately, and that's that kind of circles back almost to this uh this concept of academic freedom. It's like, you know, if you are studying something that that goes against the consensus or that people don't like, it'll it'll stir up a controversy. I think we have public support, but within the academic community, it's, uh, it's less so. But I, I will say that I, I think the tides are changing a little bit in that, in that the classic advice, you know, I was given is, you know, get a um, discipline and get a PhD in a science related field. And then, you know, pursue parapsychology study consciousness research on the side if you want, right? Which is pretty much what I did. Um, but you know, the other advice was like, don't tell anybody. And it was like, well, I've told people, I've showed people our prior interviews who've been on my, you know, dissertation committee and my, you know, and they, they think highly of it. I think that we can almost draw this parallel between, um, there's a lot of, um, scientists and scholars 
who actually really have the backs of parapsychology and consciousness research who are just too afraid to speak up. And, you know, because their reputation's on the line, they they don't want to speak up. I mean, there there's there's so many of them. It's the silent majority almost. Likewise, you know, with the trans community, there's a lot of people that are kind of against the way things are currently going, want to steer the ship a different way, uh, but are just not able to speak up because, again, you know, their entire social network is dependent on um, them be walking on these eggshells. I know there's a concept uh, that's been in the news a lot lately. It, it's come out of uh, black studies called intersectionality. And it, it would mean that, uh, you know, the combination of different stigmatized identities. So, if, if you were a, a black trans person, that would be even worse. You would, you would be discriminated against for multiple re reasons. But let me ask you this, as, as somebody who has a professional interest in parapsychology and is also trans, I would imagine that's also a form of intersectionality. It is. It's quite a strange space to be in, you know, because a lot of the, <laughs> a lot of trans people are very traumatized from religion and they're, you know, they're, against religion and anything resembling spirituality there, they stay far, far away from. It's not too, I would say it's not impossible to, you know, find, you'll find other trans people that are deeply spiritual in some way and are interested in um, this kind of research, but it's, it's pretty rare. It, it is this intersection. It, it is quite this strange place to be, strange space to be in. Well, I know, for example, that the uh, statistics regarding violence against trans people uh, is quite high, probably higher than any other single demographic group as far as I know. And, and also suicides are very high amongst trans people. Isn't that the case? Um, suicides are higher than um, the general population, uh, but it has been decreasing as time passes. So you'll hear a lot of talking points, you know, generally from the right wing, not everybody on the right, not to make political categorizations too much, but um, you will hear a talking point that, you know, transition doesn't work. It doesn't improve um, mental health. You know, that's not what any studies have showed. That's, that's a misrepresentation of what they found. What they did find is that it doesn't, always reduce it all the way to the level of the general population, you know, which is to be expected because gender dysphoria, while it's can, a lot of it can be resolved from transitioning, it doesn't go all the way down. Uh, you, you, there's no cure for it completely. There's still other men underlying mental health issues to often address, you know, and, and we need to, we need to recognize that as a community and mm -hmm. hold each other accountable for, addressing those things. Well, one might think that gender dysphoria, and I know very little about it, to be honest, but uh, one area that uh, I ha have a little more background in is the question of self-esteem. And, and it does seem to me that gender dysphoria could just be a, a, a symptom of a deeper issue having to do with low self-esteem. Yeah, um, I think for some people that is. That's why it's so important to be evaluated, right? Make sure gender dysphoria is really what you have and certainly make sure medical transition is the right path for you, you know, if you're going to go down it. Um, if it is a simple self-esteem issue, I mean, they're often entangled, which is, which is why it's harder to, you know, kind of separate them. Um, but ultimately, you know, the question of will transition improve my life, that could in theory still be true for somebody who has self-esteem issues. Somebody might have self-esteem issues because they have gender dysphoria, so they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. I happen to know, uh, in a couple of instances, parents of uh, children who 
went through transition. And I uh, know that in, in, in the cases of which I'm aware, it's an enormous struggle for the parents to come to terms with this be, because at least in, in our day and age, most people who are old enough to be Parents are are just not used to this at all. The idea is if, if you're married and you have children, you have, for the most part, pretty strong sexual or gender identities. And, and the idea that your child wouldn't be like you in, in that regard is almost impossible for some parents to comprehend. It is, yeah. You know, I'm at an age now where I have to decide, you know, do I want kids? Do I not want kids? Whether that's adopted or otherwise, right? And it's like, one of the considerations is that you often, like, you don't know what you're going to get. You know, you don't know, you, like, you just don't know. You know, you have this vision, possibly as a future parent, where it's like, this is what your kid is going to look like. Things can go very wrong in many ways. Not even necessarily that gender dysphoria is wrong, but it's like, it's very jarring in, in, in the sense to parents. I'll, I'll use the terms in the literature that homosexual transsexual subtype that, um, you know, is basically the, um, the young transitioning ones that can be jarring on the parents, but even the older transitioning ones, especially because they'll often live their lives as successful men for many, many years. And then Later, and then it's like, what are you talking about? Gender dysphoria? How could, you know? And it turns out, yeah, they've been battling that for, for many years. Well, Danny Caputi, I want to thank you so much for being with me today. And I'm also looking forward to many more conversations with you on this topic and also about our other mutual interests in the paranormal. Sounds good. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be with you. And for those of you listening or watching, thank you for being with us. The inaugural issue of the New Thinking Aloud magazine was just released on March 1st. You can download a free PDF copy from the New Thinking Aloud Foundation website.